children of Israel were sentenced to wander in the wilderness for 40 years because of their unbelief. But those years have now expired and they're poised to enter into the Canaan land. They're ready to claim their inheritance in the land of promise. However, before they can enter into the Canaan land, there is one final and major obstacle, and that is the Jordan River. It says in verse 1, Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Acacia Grove and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they crossed over. Jordan River is uh, symbolic in the Bible. We hear Jordan River spoken of uh, many, many times. Uh, there have been a host of songs that have been written about the Jordan River. You don't hear them as much as what you did years ago. And you don't hear, I, I've not heard of any new songs being written about the Jordan River. But uh, many of them are in reverence to passing over the Jordan River, meaning that we're headed to our home in heaven. Really, symbolically, that's not what it meant, but yet I don't see why, you know, that would be a problem for us to make that correlation there. The British uh, hymn writer, Samuel Stennett, he wrote years ago, which most of you would probably recognize, or the older folk in our congregation, on Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. I'm bound for the promised land. You remember that song, many of you do. One of the old time spirituals said, I looked over Jordan and what did I see? It's coming to carry me home. A band of angels coming after me, coming to carry me home. The one that I like was the old Blackwood, the original Blackwood Brother Quartet. They sang a song that said, On the Jordan banks I stand and the river is deep and wide. I will have no fear for the Lord is near. I'm going to reach the other side. And you know what? That song is very fitting with our sermon today, Joshua chapter 3. It tells us about the crossing of the Jordan River. And we begin by asking the important uh, question, why does this particular river matter so much? And the answer is, the Jordan River serves as a boundary marker. And the people of God had to cross the river in order to get into the promised land. Jo uh, Joshua 3 emphasizes this great truth. And that is, God's work must be done in God's way to receive God's blessing. That's a very important thing for us to understand today. It's not just getting across the river that matters, but my friend, it must be done in such a way that our God gets the glory. That's the important thing. So God will bless anyone who does his work in his way, so just the way that he says to do it, so that he will receive the glory. The reverse of that is, God's blessing will be withheld from those who think that they know a better way than God. And I'm going to tell you what, we've all been guilty of that sometime or another. Every person faces his or her Jordan uh, from time to time. You've been there. When I stood out there and shook hands with people after the first service, some of them said, Pastor, you remember when I crossed over my Jordan? You know, and we all have Jordans in life that we cross over. And we deal with obstacles that maybe would hinder us from obtaining spiritual victory in our lives. That's the Jordan that we must get over. And the, I, I will tell you that these obstacles sometimes make us feel like we're never going to enter into the Canaan of victory and enjoy the abundant life that God has promised for all of his followers. Satan would have us to say, no, it can't be done. But while it is true that I do not know of the obstacles that you are, are most of you, some of them, we had several this week, but I, you know, I don't know of everyone in here of the obstacles that you're facing in life. However, I will tell you what I know today. I know that we serve a God who specializes in overcoming the overwhelming and leading his children into victory. I know this God, and I believe that you do too. Most of you do. And there are some things that the children of Israel had to do by faith and also by obedience to get across this Jordan. 
So the same way that they had to do these things, I will tell you that we too have to do these things in order to be able to move us past our Jordan rivers that stand between us and spiritual victory. Three things I want to give to you today. First of all, the coordination of the crossing. These are important things that we need to do as the children of Israel did. It says in verse 2, So it was after three days. Now each of these tribes has an assigned place in the camp and uh, where they were to march as soon as camp uh, uh, broke. Uh, they had their responsibilities. And you might wonder why that they stopped here for three days. I believe that it was so they could prepare the people and coordinate the crossing of the river. When you've got this big a group of people, certainly you want to get organized. Uh, to almost two million people, uh, it's going to take a lot of organization in order for them to do what they needed to do. If you see, if you see, and of course we're talking about uh, crossing this huge river. Uh, I, I'm sure that when the people got there and they saw the Jordan River, it caused them great concern. Some of you have gone with us to Israel and uh, you have seen there the Jordan River and you say, what's the big deal, you know? Because nowadays, if you were to go there, the, the Jordan River is not that wide. Uh, actually, uh, on uh, numerous occasions, we baptized there. Uh, people in the Jordan River because people desire to be baptized there. I explained to the people, look, you've already been baptized. But if you want to be dunked under the water in the place that Jesus was baptized, then uh, we'll do that. You know, we'll have a service where we'll do that. And we do. Um, I don't do it. I always ask one of the other pastors to do it. And I've been out there. Don't care to get into the muddy, uh, cold uh, Jordan River anymore, you know. And uh, so I let them do it. My son, one time when he went with us on a trip um, there to Israel, I had him do it that year. And as soon as they got through baptizing everybody, he swam out into the middle. And another gentleman, I can't remember who it was that was with us, swam out into the middle of the Jordan River until he got in trouble. And somebody that runs the organization there came out and said, come out here. You can't swim out there like that. And I'm going to tell you something later on in the sermon that made me nervous once I read this, that he was out there in the middle of the Jordan River. But I said that to just say it was not, it's not very wide right now. However, the, the river was a lot wider back then. I've read a lot of detail about that. Don't have time to put it into my sermon today. There's a lot of reasons why that the Jordan River is not as wide today as what it was then. But, um, but also, we are told that, especially during that period of time, the Bible talks about it is during harvest time that it has, it has swollen, this river. Uh, perhaps up to a mile wide, this river is at this particular time. That's 50 times wider than it would normally be. And it is, uh, and you know, with that thought of mine, isn't is it uh, amazing when God asks us to do things that he w- waits until it seems like it's an impossible thing to do? I mean, why couldn't God work it out that they would cross the Jordan River when it wasn't swelling? You know, uh, why, why couldn't it have been that way? No, God had a reason why that he took them down there to the Jordan River when the thing was swelling at that particular time. And so they wait three days. Joshua coordinates the officers to instruct the people concerning the crossing. And so this instructive coordinating, it included three things. First of all, the crossing involved watching God. Look with me in verse 2. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp and they commanded the people saying, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites bearing it. Now remember the Ark of the Covenant. Um, that was that special piece of, of uh, tabernacle furniture that s- symbolized the presence and the power of God. You remember that in the Old Testament when the Ark was in the Holy of Holies that the glory of God rested upon it and it was the dwelling place of God. That's where God came. It, to Israel, it represented God's presence uh, in their midst. God came down and met with them. They learned very quickly to watch God. That's what they learned. 
They watched God. When God moved, then they were to move. And when God stopped, they were to stop. And my friend, I will tell you that this is a very valuable lesson for us to learn as well. When we are facing difficult times, we had better be sensitive to the movement of the Lord in and around us. Be very sensitive to what God is doing, why God is doing what he is doing, and uh, that there's a reason for these things. And when God says that we're to move, we're to move. And when God says we're to stop, we're to stop. We better be sensitive and listen to what God has to say. If you'll watch God, he'll show you what he is doing, and he will show you the path that you need to take. Also, we see their crossing involved following God. Verse 3, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Now, they're, they are called to follow God, to go after him, to pursue him. And since the people had not traveled this way before, they needed God to guide them. They needed the Lord. Going one mile across the Jordan was no easy task. I would say here's another lesson for us to learn today. We may have to leave our comfort zone in order to follow Christ. Uh, we might be going uh, something that's not comfortable for us. It might not be the easiest thing that you've ever done, my friend. But when you're following Jesus Christ, even though it's a difficult thing, it is the best thing. You're going to see, God will show you eventually, it is the best thing. And you must follow God if you're going to get past your obstacles and get into your Canaan land that God has prepared for you. Third of all, their crossing involved honoring God. Verse 4, yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. Now, they were told to keep their distance, maybe because it helped the big population to be able to see God working and what he was doing up ahead. But I want to suggest to you that I, I believe that is the reason why is because the things of God are sacred and they're to be respected, the things of God. It's important. They're not to be treated lightly. You remember the story in the Old Testament here of Uzzah and how he reached out and touched the ark of God and he died because of his irreverent act? You remember that story in the Bible? Remember our God is a holy God and there must always be a holy reverence and fear of God in our hearts. It's important every day of our life that we have that reverent fear and uh, reverence uh, of God. And uh, God will show us the path that we have to take. Uh, we can count on that. We've never, there, we've never passed this way before. We've had things in our life that have happened. We've never passed this way before. I've had some traumatic things happen in my life that I've never passed this way before. You know, don't know what to expect. You know, don't know what direction we're going to go. Uh, because of these things that have uh, taken place. But it is reassuring for the Christian to know that God is with us and when he carries us through unknown territories. God is there with us. He is with us. Hear me today. You may have never been sick before. I've had, I've had older people say, this is the first time I've ever been in the hospital. You know, I had someone say that not too long ago. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, at your age, that's pretty amazing. You know, and... uh But he's with us in sickness. He's with us in pain. He's with us in bereavement and failure and financial difficulties, uh, in misunderstandings and in opposition that we may face from other people. But in times like these, if we follow and honor God, we can have the same assurance that God gave Joshua, that God, Joshua spoke up to this group. And he told him in Deuteronomy 31, 6, I'd write that down if you'd like to memorize the scripture verse. This is one to memorize. Deuteronomy 31, 6. Be strong and be of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them for the Lord your God. He is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. What a powerful verse. That's what Joshua told the children of Israel. 
And the same message is true for us today. Second of all, let's look at the consecration for the crossing. Move on here in our shift of thought. When it came time for people to move forward across the Jordan, God calls here in the middle part of this chapter for the people to be to live consecrated lives, to a consecrated life. In other words, God is saying that if you want joy in your life, there's some requirements. Christian, you understand that? There's some requirements to have joy in your life. First of all, their crossing involved a challenge. If you want this joy, there's a challenge. Verse 5, And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Now that's a powerful verse. You, If you sanctify yourself, God's going to do some great things. He promised he would. And before they were to enter into the land, they were to prepare themselves spiritually. Victory didn't depend so much on the obstacles they faced. You know, you and I have a tendency to look at the obstacle and think, you know, how are we going to accomplish this victory? You know, victory didn't depend so much on the obstacles they faced, but it depended upon their relationship with God. That was the key thing. Christian, I'm telling you, sometimes we look at the obstacle and think that is insurmountable and you, we think that we can't overcome it when we shouldn't be looking at the obstacle and we ought to look at our relationship with God. Where am I with God? Maybe I am where I am today because I'm not right where I ought to be with God. Our relationship with God is so very important. On, um, on the night of his graduation from medical school, Dr. Howard A. Kelly a, a later on became a world-famous surgeon. This is what he wrote in his diary. He said, I dedicate myself, my time, my capabilities, my ambition, everything to him. Bless, Lord, sanctify me to thy uses. Give me no worldly success which may not lead me near to my Savior. What a wonderful prayer to pray before you begin to start in your 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 ministry or your work in life of being a help and a blessing to people. I want to tell you for spiritual victory, we too must be willing to separate ourselves from defiling sin so that we can be set apart to God's will and to his purpose for our lives. That's key. That's important. This was Israel's challenge. And the same way that it was Israel's challenge, it's our challenge. God promised Israel, and he also promises us that if we will consecrate ourselves to him, he will do wonders in our lives. That's exciting, isn't it? He's going to do wonders in our life. The psalmist wrote about that in Psalm 77, 13. Who is so great a God as our God? You are the God who does wonders. You have declared your strength among the peoples. What a powerful verse. Psalmist knew about God's wonders. He'd seen what God had done. Then we find also their crossing involved a command. If they wanted joy in their life, if we want joy in our life, there's a command there in verse 6. Then Joshua spoke to the priest saying, Take up the ark of the covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the ark and the covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you have done what when you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. Now this verse is a lot like Exodus fourteen, fourteen, and that's another good verse to memorize. It says, the Lord will fight for you, He and you shall hold your peace. The Lord will fight for you, you just hold your peace. Sometimes, God doesn't want us to fight the battles. Now, sometimes we're fighting the battles. Sometimes God doesn't want you to fight the battles. Sometimes God wants you to just stand still and let him do it. Sometimes that's true. It is not always easy for us to stand still and let God do the work, is it? Because you and I think that we know how to take care of this situation. I've got to do something. 
And I'm going to go, I've even heard people say, I got to do something. Even if it's something wrong, I got to do something. You ever heard someone say that? Yeah, you, you, certainly you have. And, you know, they look back on it and say, it was wrong, all right, and I shouldn't have done anything. Sometimes God wants us to stand still. Let him do the work. And while the people were standing still here, God commanded the priests to go out into the water. And God arranged it that way so that faith would move their, them from, from safety to danger. That's where they went to. They were, when you're on the land, friend. Now, when I was younger, I loved the water. But there's a certain, uh, um, I started to word, use the word fear, but let me use the word concern, okay? There's a certain concern about being out there in the water, and, and I can swim good. I can still swim, but I'm not going to say good anymore. You know, I'm a little heavier than what I was then. I'm afraid I'm going to sink, you know. But, uh, you know, out there in the water like that, and sometimes that rough water can start getting rough out there. But you know what? I'll tell you what. You feel comfortable when you're standing on ground, you know, on the on, on land there than being out there in that water and the boat's going down. You know, there's a, a, a world of difference there. Uh, so it, it, I'm telling you that sometimes God takes us away from the safety and puts us into the danger situation. And that is just a test. It was their test. And I'll tell you, because anybody can trust God when everything is going just fine in their own dry ground. It's easy to trust God in those times. It's easy to trust the Lord when, you know, all the bills are paid and all of the kids uh, are minding mom and dad and, you know, every, uh, husband and wife are happy with one another, uh, you know, and everything just seems to be clipping along really good. It's easy to trust God during those times. But what about the times that you're in the water when the water is swelling and it's a mile wide and it's deep there, my friend? You start getting out of that water where God commands you to go. You want me to tell you what that says? It takes faith to be there. That's what it takes. It takes faith to be there. And often there is no miracle in our lives because we don't move out into the deep where God told us to go. God told us to go there, and we don't go there, and so there's no miracles in our life. God's promised the miracles, but there's none there. God asks us to do the impossible so that when it is done, once again, I'm going to tell you, so he can get all the honor and glory. That's what God wants. He wants us to do. And then third of all, we see their crossing involved a commitment. Now, verses 9 through 13, the key words in those verses are, by this you will know that the living God is among you. Well, that's powerful there. Highlight it in your iPad or underline it in your Bible there, that you will know that the living God is among you. This became the watchword of the conquest, the key to victory over the enemies of the land. This commitment by God to his people is almost on every page of the book of Joshua as you read through it. It is a promise of his presence that still sustains God's people today. During war, the Civil War, the town of Mooresville, West Virginia was on the dividing line and of course, at this particular time, the war was uh, seesawing back and forth from the north to the south. And troops from both sides would come through uh, this little town here. And it made people nervous, whether it was, you know, soldiers on the north or the south. I mean, they've been fighting and they never know the way that they're going to act and what they're going to do, uh, what they feel like they need to take or whatever and uh, order to uh, help them or sustain them in the war. And on one particular, uh, one particular day, history told about some Union soldiers that came into the home of this little grandmother that she was kind of nervous, concerned any time any of the soldiers came through. And they asked her, they came in her home and said they wanted something to eat. And so she very quickly put together some food and told them that it was their practice in their home, in her home, that they always uh, read the Bible 
And she always read it before they ever ate. And so she began reading Psalm 27, which I love, Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamped against me, my heart shall not fear. The war rises against me. Yet I will be confident. She gets down to the last verse. Wait on the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Then she told the soldier, we always pray before we eat. And she began praying and talking to the Lord. Well, I guess it was more than what they could take because they realized that she wasn't going to be a person of fear. And it kind of made them nervous. So while she was praying, they all slipped out and left. God just took care of the situation. Listen, friend. When we know that God is with us, we don't have to fear. I don't care what the situation is. It might be a dangerous situation. We might come to that place in our country where where other countries are facing it today. There are people that are meeting in churches today. They have no idea who's going to come in and disrupt their service. Soldiers that will come in, sometimes burn their buildings down and shoot everyone there. That is taking place in a lot of countries of the world today. We see here in comfort and ease in America, but the day may come that we face these things, but we don't have to fear because our God is with us. Regardless what happens, we don't have to fear. Back to the Bible teacher from many years ago, Woodrow Kroll, some of you used to listen to him on the radio. He said, with the power of God within us, we need never fear the powers around us. And he's absolutely right, friend. So God's people accepted the challenge and they consecrated themselves to the Lord. Now, last of all, we look at the completion of the crossing. The day finally arrives and they're going to cross the Jordan into the Canaan. First of all, we see their crossing involved movement. Verse 14, so it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan with the priest bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as those who bore the ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priest who bore the ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest. Now, the people folded their tents. They followed the ark-bearing priest down to the brink of the Jordan River. And it's about time that this complaining bunch of people get their focus straight and move forward and do what God's told them to do. Now in our story today, we find that they have consecrated themselves. They've been obedient to the Lord. But if you look back just a few years, you would understand that this group of people were wandering in the wilderness for a reason, because they're complaining. They did not have their focus on God that I've made reference to it before, but it's very glaring to us of that period of time when Moses sent over 12 spies into the land to see what was into the Canaan land. And there you know that they found giants in the land. They found a, a big wall to cities there. And so there, that group of 12, after they scouted out, 10 of them came back. They gave a negative report because they lack faith. God had told them to take the land, regardless of what there is there. They might say it's impossible, but our God is a God who deals with the impossible. But I'm telling you, they came back, they gave a negative report because of their lack of faith. And I, I'm submitting to you today that when you focus on your fears instead of your faith, when you focus on your foes instead of our Heavenly Father, there will be no movement in your life towards spiritual victory. You're not going to have victory in your life if you focus on those things rather than focusing on God. I find it interesting that these spies, the 12 spies went out as one, but they came back as two groups. You remember the story. They came back that way. Um, both groups had traveled the same route. They had experienced the same view, and yet they saw two totally different things. One group saw the opportunities. The other group saw the obstacles. One group saw the grapes. The other group saw the, the giants. One saw, one group saw the blessings and the other group saw the burdens. Two groups of people. 
You know what? I, I say to you today, we still have two groups of people among God's people today. That those who see the blessings and others who see the burdens. And that's all they can see in life is the burdens. And the great lesson here today, my friend, is don't take your cues from the crowd. Don't do it, my friend. The majority should not necessarily rule because the majority isn't necessarily right. A lot of times they aren't, especially in the world we live in today. A lot of times the majority isn't right. And, uh, and I'm, I'm concerned that we're not going to, God's people and righteousness isn't going to be in the majority anymore, you know, um, in our land and in our world. There's always going to be the naysayers who say it can't be done. You're always going to have that. I, I love the story that I've told on numerous occasions of almost 2,000 years ago, Martin Van Buren was governor of New York, and he wrote a letter to President Andrew Jackson. Later on, you become vice president with uh, um, Andrew Jackson. But with his offer, he was, he was writing this letter in his observation about this new transportation phenomenon called the railroad train. He's concerned about it. And this is his letter. The, the, he said, Mr. President, railroad carriages are pulled at the enormous speed of 15 miles per hour by engines, which in addition to endangering life and limb of passengers, roar and snort their way through the countryside, setting fire to crops, scaring the livestock, and frightening women and children. They will disrupt business, boost unemployment, weaken our nation's defense, and besides that, the Almighty certainly never intended that people should travel at such a breakneck speed. That was his letter of what he wrote to the president. <laughs> Boy, if he could have known how people laughed at that nowadays, he sure wouldn't have written that letter. But, you know, there are always people around who have the clouded vision and uh, they do their best to try to impede our progress because they're looking at the future in the rearview mirror. There are some people that way. It's time for God's children of Israel to move forward. We've seen all what they've gone through. It's time for them to move forward. The crossing of the Jordan meant that Israel was irrevocably committed to moving forward against armies, against giants, against fortified cities. Whatever it is, we're moving forward. It doesn't make any difference. What is in our way? God's told us to go forward, and so we're going to go forward. And so they made the move to quit walking according to the flesh and now, as they had often done in the wilderness, and now they are walking by faith in the true and living God. I'm going to follow God. I, I'm going to give him all, regardless of what it costs me, which I promise you, it won't cost you, it will give to you. But you, some people think it might. Walking by faith, trusting the living God. The fact that some two million people were willing to cross that flooded Jordan it showed that they were willing to trust God and God was glorified. It takes faith and trust in Almighty God to move forward. Christian, you hear me? That's what it takes. You'll move forward? That's what it takes. The same is true for us today, the same way it was for them. And unless we step out by faith and get our feet wet, we get into the water where God told us to be, we're not going to make much progress in the victorious Christian life to what God tells us to do. Last of all, their crossing involved a miracle. Thank God for the miracle. Verse 16. The waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far above uh, away at Adam, the city there, the city that is beside Zeratan. So the waters that went down into the sea of Ereba, the salt sea, failed and were cut off and the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Then the priest who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed complete, completely over the Jordan. Now, it was a miracle that these people crossed on dry ground. 
And when the Bible says it's dry ground, I promise you, it's dry ground. We're not talking about muck, you know. We're not talking about mud. We're talking about dry ground, and that's a miracle in itself. When you've got water like that in a ground, uh, it's a miracle try, that they crossed on dry ground. Now, not only does the Bible tell us, you think about this, that it was at flood level, about a mile wide, but during that time, the water current uh, changes also. Normally, maybe two or three miles an hour. Now, it's up to 10 miles an hour. You know, can you imagine trying to cross a mile wide river that's uh, swiftly moving 10 miles an hour? And not only on top of that, and I'll tell you what made me nervous about now that I look back and thinking Robert out there in the middle of Jordan River, the book of Jeremiah, as I was reading through my studies on this, Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 5, Jeremiah talked about that there was tangled growth in the Jordan that made it almost impossible to go through. I find that, find that interesting also there. Another thing that adds to of them crossing the Jordan River. There just wasn't any human strategy that could get those people over to the western side of the river. There just was no way it could be done. It was God's plan. God had said to do it. And when they stepped out by faith and the priests put their feet in the water, God would get them across the river. And he did. Just like God said he would. You do what I tell you to do, I'll take care of you. You don't have to be afraid. I'm there. It'll be accomplished. The book of Joshua is about the victory of faith and the glory that comes to God when his people will just trust and obey. That's all you have to do. Trust and obey. In the Christian life, making the application today, you are either an overcomer or you are overcome. Either you are a victor or you are a victim. One of the two. God saved us to make us make soldiers out of us and move us forward by faith to claim our rich inherited inheritance in Jesus Christ. God wants to bless us. He wants us to receive our inheritance. But what a tragedy is when God's people fail to claim their inheritance and they wander aimlessly through life as Israel did in the wilderness. And Christian, I'm going to tell you, I see a lot of Christians that are wandering aimlessly through the wilderness. Never victory in their spiritual life. And the greater tragedy is, I would tell you, of people who have never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. They've never crossed over the Jordan River in this life and they're dying in their sins. And maybe you're here and you're like that today. I I want you to hear the message very loud, plain, and clear today that Jesus is the only passage that will get you over that river of death, the Jordan River of life, the river of death and damnation that comes to everyone that rejects God the Father in heaven. Many people reject him. The only way to get there is through Jesus Christ. And there is salvation in no other, no, no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Acts 4.12. And that is the name of Jesus. He's the only way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to God the Father except by me. So Christian, until we yield ourselves to God, We're not ready for the miracle we need. You say, Pastor, I need a miracle today. Yield yourself to God. Yielding means that we step into the water by faith and we leave the results in God's hands. It's up to him. Well, Pastor, you just don't know what I'm going to. Yeah, I hear it over and over. You don't understand, you know. Leave it in God's hands. Trust him. Obey him. Leave it in God's hands. And here's the good news. When God calls us to move forward unto, into the unknown, we need not fear because God is already there. He's already there. Before we ever go in there, God is there with us. And why be afraid of crossing Jordan when God has already crossed it for us? Hear me today. Lost friend, he went into Jesus Christ, went into the dark waters of death, 
and he came out victorious on the other side. And thank God where we who are we can be saved and we who are saved, we can be victorious in our life too. But do you know the Lord? I like the old song, I won't have to cross Jordan alone. Jesus died for my sins to atone. In the darkness I see, he'll be waiting for me. I won't have to cross Jordan alone. Do you know the Lord today? You may be in a very difficult place in your life. And um could very well be that God has you exactly where he wants you today. But the God, my friend, who brought you to this place won't leave you there alone. I promise you, you won't. You don't need to know, you don't need to know what tomorrow holds, my friend, as long as you know who holds tomorrow. That's the only important thing. God holds tomorrow. I began talking about the Jordan River and the music that's associated with it. And I'm going to end it with a song in 1940, Oscar Elizan, he wrote a song based on this story today. And let think of these words. Do they apply to your life today? They probably do. Got any rivers you think are uncrossable? Got any mountains you can't tunnel through? God specializes in things thought impossible. And he will do what no other power can do. That's my God.